Could I uh, get everyone's attention as we reconvene for the fourth panel of the day? Uh, my name's James Stravopoulos. I'm the Associate Dean here at the Law School, and I have the great pleasure of moderating this panel on civil liberties. Uh, John's connection to civil liberties and his tremendous advocacy on behalf of the cause in Canada is well known, I'm sure, to most of you. Um, he is a long-standing, long-serving member of the Board of Directors for the Canadian Civil Liberties Association, and he has also served uh, for a number of years as chair of the board. Uh, hence, uh, this panel on civil liberties, because this is one of John's passions, to be sure, as he's quietly worked behind the scenes to advance the cause over the course of his career. Uh, I'll very briefly introduce our two speakers and our discussant. I'm not planning on taking you through their biographies, which are contained in the, uh, in the uh, materials that were distributed uh, in the conference binder. Uh, just going from uh, my immediate left uh, and then further along, I'll begin with our first speaker, Natalie DeRosier. She is general counsel uh, to the Canadian Civil Liberties Association, and she's also a professor at the Faculty of Law at the University of Ottawa. And she'll be speaking to us about her paper, The Advocacy Function in Canada and the Role of Non-Government Organizations. Uh, the next person along the way is Faye Faraday. She is here at Osgood this year as, the McMurtry Clinical, as a McMurtry Clinical Visiting Fellow, and she'll be uh, speaking to her paper, Civil Society and Rights Litigation, Grassroots Nourishing the Charter Tree. And then finally, our discussant is a well-known to all of you in the Osgood community, Professor Sonia Lawrence, um, and she'll be uh, reacting to the two presentations. So without any further delay, Natalie. So thank you very much. Um, first of all, I think uh, this afternoon what we are doing is honoring John in another capacity in his role as leader. And I have to say uh, one of his uh, great role, I think, for the Canadian Civil Liberties Association was to keep us on track to ensure that we, uh, that we uh, survived and indeed supported both uh, the executive directors over the, the, the time. I think last night you heard about how he had to uh, take Alan Borovoy's late night calls. I thinking after last night that I should call uh, John uh, late at night. I may become a funnier woman. So uh, uh, the the um, the idea I think uh, here is is to recognize the uncanny ability that John McCamus has to make everybody feel respected in an organization so that it functions. Uh, people stay. Uh, they continue to uh, stay in the organization, they don't quit, and also not only are individuals feeling part of it, but as an institution, so we continue to work and work well. So it's this ability to allow institutions to function and function well that I want to honor here. And my uh, paper is essentially about how do we know when we're doing it right? How do we know whether uh, a non-governmental organization is doing right in the advocacy context? I start with three examples. Uh, this month, uh, we feel pretty good at the Canadian Civil Liberties Association. We uh, have had um, an esteemed uh, university who, after receiving uh, one of our letters, has decided to uh, discontinue a protocol on student protest that it was about to uh, release. Uh, we also had a municipality that uh, wrote to us yesterday that after uh, banning someone from municipal offices for five years, within 24 hours after receiving CCLA's letter, rescinded the ban. We also know last year, I think, uh, when we were part of a large co coalition, uh, the federal government having tabled the legislation that was increasing police powers to obtain electronic identity of individuals. The legislation was called Protecting Children from Internet Predators Act. Uh, the legislation was eventually uh, tabled and the government promised that indeed there would be amendments. Another example, slightly less positive, was on the power of influence. In 2012, the Canadian Minister of Immigration amended a draconian bill to deal with irregular arrivals of persons seeking refugee status in Canada by decreasing the length of their proposed mandatory detention from 12 months to six months after various advocacy groups had decried the bill. And the minister suggested that he had listened to us. So how do we know, actually, 
whether we are getting right since if you read the literature, it is quite clear in Peter Baer, which is, uh, I'm quoting here, says, there is absolutely no evidence of any real influence of the NGO sector in the field of human rights. Uh, indeed, that would uh, suggest, uh, contrary to our intuition, and, has, uh, uh, and I'm sorry to say, John, that despite the fact that last night you said you were trying to make a real difference, this may be the area where there was no real difference to be made. Nevertheless, I think the, the paper is about trying to uh, look to uh, uh, different bodies of literature to explore what can we learn? Is there something that we can learn to develop uh, some model to assess performance of the NGO? So I start first, I think, by uh, uh, trying to develop a little bit a theory of the advocacy function that's necessary in uh, our democracy, and essentially, I think my uh, my objective here is to situate this advocacy function, which is usually identified as being essential to the rule of law, uh, within the democratic principle as well. So, in a way, I think we know, and uh, that uh, traditionally we've always identified the independence of the bar as being. Uh, essential to having a body responsible to ensure compliance with legal norms, and certainly it continues to be part of the advocacy function. But uh, because I've been a student of uh, uh, John McCamus and certainly of Rod McDonald, I think obviously the advocacy function is shared more widely by a large variety of actors, trained and not trained in law, who ensure that injustice is identified and indeed that people are helped in their complaining functions and they are actually motivated to exercise their rights. So most people, I think, recognize that the advocacy function is not only about rights, but also about the responsibility within the decision makers and their various form to stop uh, themselves from acting beyond the law, to stop themselves from abusing power. In this context, seeking accountability is very much part of advocacy. When uh, CCLA asks for police uh, accountability, it uh, resists any claims that it's anti-police. It says, on the contrary, it is pro-police, uh, it is helping police uh, to deliver what they should do. It's honored them with our demands to actually behave according to, to the law and to the, the act that they should be. So uh, I think in, in a way, I think we also are very much in the, uh, uh, the business of engaging the general public about valuing uh, their rights. And the real guarantee in our view of constitutional compliance is that the population values uh, the rights, punishing the ones that undermine the rights, either electro electorally or otherwise, and validating the claims of those who, yet, who seek to enforce them. Law lives in a culture that may nurture or annihilate it. And I think we also say, in my work I've also said that the advocacy function needs to reach three audiences, the powerless, the powerful, and the indifferent. A healthy democracy function is certainly essential to the rule of law, and as you know, I'm just going to quote some, some uh, cases that actually do recognize that they would be embedded in Canadian constitutional law, a right to ha ensure that the uh, constitution is obeyed and complied with. But nevertheless, and if I want to say, I want to move a little bit further than that and say that, um, you know, here is, you know, the, the you know, well-known, uh, the right of the citizenry to con constitutional behavior, uh, fundamental right of the public to governance according to the law, and even, I think, uh, in the latest case, uh, Cromwell speaking, uh, and adding something that I will want to debate here a little bit, uh, that says, uh, certainly, I think we want to ensure access to justice for disadvantaged people, uh, but of course, this should not be equated with a license to grant standing to whoever decides to set themselves up as the representative of the poor and the marginalized. And the issue that I want to take up here is to recognize an advocacy function that is shared more widely. And this is not really in pursuit of protecting CCLA's advantage, so that is a position. So I will try to explain why I think it's important to view uh, the advocacy functions more widely, and then I'll justify why indeed 
uh, if you're at CCLA, you're particularly concerned of uh, exercising a position of privilege and the responsibility that may come from that. So in my view, an advocacy function is certainly essential to the democratic principles beyond the simple compliance issue. In, view, in my view, democratic engagement is fostered by the advocacy function. And indeed, I think the ar argument is based on the following assumption. A democracy, a democracy embraces the role of citizens in debates about its own governance and about the society in which they live. So in that sense, we would welcome anybody saying, I am uh, taking the charge of denouncing injustice, even if I am not the person who has suffered uh, it because I am diminished by the presence of injustice. The participation of citizens in their own governance uh, in front of the courts and elsewhere is a good in itself, and it's worth the expense and the discomfort. Participation in law-based dispute resolution is not a privilege, it's not to be discouraged, it's actually a service to one's community, and it's, there is a public duty to fight injustice, to denounce it, and to try to remedy it, and this is, in fact, almost a domestic adaptation of the duty to protect that is uh, emerging at international law. So passerby, in that context, passerby indifference is unacceptable, and uh, not that I'm suggesting that we ha all develop a vigilante approach uh, and that would not respect privacy rights or the right to be left alone, but I'm suggesting that institutionally, we must develop better responsibility to habilitate people to see injustice and to have a sense in which they can do something about this, the, the ones that they suffer themselves and the one that they see elsewhere. So in a way, I think in a mature democracy, we recognize that injustice and inequality is live in complex ways, partly internalized, partly accepted, partly condoned, partly wished away. In a sense, I think we should always be uh, uh, happy to habilitate even people that seek to represent themselves as wanting to represent the poor and the marginalized. But so that doesn't help ourselves in terms of trying how to do it and how to do it well. And this is a little bit the rest of this paper, which uh, seeks to look at three bodies of literature. I look at uh, what has been done on efficiency and accountability and legitimacy of NGOs at international law, looking at what are the models that are emerging there. I look a little bit at the literature surrounding uh, the issue of ombudsman. I'm happy to uh, refer to that in the context in which uh, John was also, is also an ombudsman, uh, but there may be some, some uh, ways in which this could be useful. And finally, uh, social movement literature. Uh, in a way, many of the NGOs emerge as a social movement organization. They draw themselves, their existence be, uh, is uh, rooted in a social movement that preceded it. This is the case certainly for the Civil Liberties Association and many other organizations of that form that arose uh, in the context of the civil rights movement of the 60s. So the CCLA will uh, be 50 next year, and it is an, an organization that was built in the 60s. So um, there is a large literature about uh, legitimacy of uh, NGO, and you will understand why it, it's, uh, it seeks to answer the question, why them? Why are they there? Why are they listened to? And uh, in Canada, the uh, uh, debate over legitimacy of NGOs has taken a much more subtle form. Uh, if I may uh, uh, refer to you, said so in Canada, I think basically what we have, we had Manfredi uh, criticizing the Supreme Court for being captured by special interest uh, uh, in his book in 2004, but it's unclear whether he was criticizing more, uh, not so much the special interest, but the court for being captured by it. Uh, but certainly, I think the current challenges to the legitimacy of NGOs in Canada, or advocacy NGOs, is done in the following way. There is an attempt to, to uh, challenge their charitable status, to describe their membership as being terrorists or troublemakers, and often defamation lawsuits may be used to silence them, various NGOs, and that has led to a, a recognition that anti-SLAP legislation may be necessary. Certainly, I think when we look at the way in which uh, 
people assess the legitimacy and the efficiency of, of NGO, we have the following spectrum. Some people say the legitimacy question is irrelevant. Uh, some people argue, for example, that uh, NGOs are just political corporations. They are legitimate because they exist. And the market, the political market of IDs determine their influence and uh, their sustainability. If they uh, lose it, uh, lose their influence or their sustainability, they will disappear. But they are legitimate because they exist. And there's no reason uh, why we should uh, uh, argue about this. Other authors, I think, uh, engage more fully with the issue of legitimacy and try to say there is a debate here that must be uh, confronted. And I'm one that thinks that uh, to the extent that you can claim legitimacy and argue for it, it is worth investigating why you should claim such legitimacy and what are you, the responsibility that come with that. So. Um, I'm uh, particularly attracted to uh, Hugo Slim's uh, voice accountability model, which I uh, presents this as in the following way. He will say, uh, NGO has to decide whether they're speaking as the poor, with the poor, for the poor, or about the poor. And you know, suggesting that basically there's nothing wrong with uh, uh, being one or various of this, but you have to be transparent about this. And it is unacceptable to masquerade as speaking as the poor, or with the poor, if you're indeed, your structure allows you simply to speak about the poor. And if you translate that in, in uh, other contexts, it would be about the people whose rights have been violated and so on. So speaking as the poor would demand, in terms of if you're transparent, to have a, a membership that actually reflects uh, the people you're trying to, to represent. If you're speaking with the poor, then I think you would have to be connected, if not yourself, but uh, groups that are uh, grassroots oriented. Uh, for the poor and about the poor, I think uh, give you more uh, ability to uh, speak in outside of a classic representation model, where you don't have to prove that indeed uh, your membership reflects who you speak for. I think I think the model could also be uh, uh, adapted to other views, which would be what I would call the principle accountability or the value accountability model, where uh, a little bit the way in which uh, the famous uh, book that says, should trees have standing, we seek to, uh, uh, to give voice, to give a visage, to give a human face to uh, a principle, a value. Our case would be uh, the protection of fundamental freedoms and so on. So we're going to try to create institutions that speak up uh, uh, to, uh, to the issue and represent it uh, in that context. So I think to the extent that we're going to uh, use a model like this, then I think the ombudsman model may be useful uh, because uh, Ombudsman, like NGOs, often will seek to exert pressure, will try to influence, uh, but really they could be dutifully ignored, uh, uh, and, and some are. Uh, so the, reflecting on what uh, makes a good ombudsman, what makes a good uh, uh, a possibility to succeed in that venture may be useful to look from the NGO perspective. So uh, the, the framework that I've developed uh, in terms of uh, setting up an evaluation framework against which uh, I think uh, uh, CCLA could be uh, evaluated, uh, drawing from the, the, body of uh, the three bodies of literature that I've discussed, uh, would seek to speak about it, transparency, independence. Uh, and I, in my view, I think independence does not demand to be unbiased. It demands to uh, ensure that all points of view are covered and that you are not partisan, politically uh, partisan. Expertise, leveraging expertise, uh, both uh, uh, academic expertise, uh, multidisciplinary expertise, and so on. And uh, certainly I've said, since uh, John is my boss, a proper use of resources is necessary, for sure. Uh, accuracy, I think uh, if you want to speak truth to power, you have to make efforts to tell the truth. And I think the, uh, the efforts that are made, I think it is legitimate to, uh, uh, to debate uh, the legitimacy of, of, um, of NGOs to the extent that they seek to, to tell the truth uh, when they are not accurate. 
and I think eventually, I think we want to ensure that there's uh, the possibility uh, to exert pressure in a, in a consistent way uh, and an intelligent, strategic way and uh, that uh, there would be met by some measure of influence. The challenges, uh, which are very useful to read about, this looks all good, but what are the things that you should not do? What are the dangers that are lurking out there what, uh, that you could uh, be uh, 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 you know, caught with? And certainly, I think many people have uh, discussed how the dangers are certainly co-optation or another great phrase, uh, symbolic reassurance, uh, which would mean essentially a decision maker that uses the, a little bit a la Minister of Immigration here, a la, which says, I have listened and therefore moved from 12 months mandatory to six months mandatory, uh, instead of listening fully to the in a, inappropriateness of the mandatory detention. So being manipulated uh, uh, by uh, powers that exist in a way that would uh, support their agenda. This is what it's called, that's the way, the way in which um, symbol, symbolic reassurance uh, does occur. Now, the other uh, dangers in, are quite well known, fatigue or direct annihilation by opposing forces where indeed uh, uh, the group actually disappears because of a lack of support. I wanna just touch about what the, uh, where I think they could be more interesting uh, discussions with my panelists, I think, uh, are some of the dilemmas. Uh, I mean, the, the paper is constructed in the following way. Is the model that uh, we're setting up, will that help resolve some of the uh, dilemmas that are facing uh, NGOs, advocacy NGOs um, in their work? And the first dilemma all the time is the short-term, long-term uh, objectives. Uh, in my view, I think the, most NGOs see themselves as a long-term agenda. They're seeking to build capacity within the group, you know, and empower the powerless, stop the powerful from abusing their power, uh, get the indifferent to care. Uh, so they are really trying to build a, a democracy. However, they cannot afford to have no success in the short term uh, because that will uh, create a sense of disempowerment and a sense of fatigue or uh, or discouragement. So this balance about uh, wanting to both uh, succeed uh, in the short term while maintaining your long-term goal is one that we uh, face constantly. My sense is that transparency is what will be useful here, which will be to acknowledge a short-term goal, a short-term strategy, uh, provided that it uh, fulfills or is consistent with the long-term uh, objective. The second dilemma that I'm going to briefly uh, touch upon, but I think uh, Faye is going to uh, deal with this in a much more eloquent fashion, is the role of lawyers. Uh, the literature is not very kind uh, to the, the way in which lawyers are uh, invited to speak in social movements. I mean, there's a large body that would say uh, lawyers are uh, disabling advocacy. They are experts that take the place of uh, real, so, uh, real uh, social movements. There's a response to this, which is now the mobilization through law movement, which is helpful, I think. Nevertheless, there's a concern that uh, expert knowledge can silence. Uh, um, expert uh, expertise in that context may uh, disempower people from speaking out, and that there is I'm quoting here, the, an advantage for the middle class at times to pretend to care by only listening to certain voices, uh, i.e. the white uh, voices of, uh, of an expert a professional body. So how to uh, manage this enabling advocacy versus uh, possibly disabling advocacy is one that I think uh, demands some concerns. The third uh, one I think relates a little bit to this, which is grassroots advocacy versus elite uh, leveraging. Certainly, I think one of the uh, issue when you in the social movement literature, the access to elite, to convincing elite, there's nothing wrong uh, with trying to get the elite to care and to engage, to spend resources uh, uh, and to embrace the values that you're trying to, to protect. Uh, the danger is when indeed uh, you get to be co-opted or manipulated 
in a way that undermines the, the mission in the long run. So uh, the, the real issue, I think, for uh, uh, reflecting on the, the, the issue of are you going to be mostly grassroots or are you going to be uh, in the context of elite leveraging uh, will continue to be, I think, responded by uh, transparency, independence, uh, safeguard against uh, trying to really um, uh, respond to both the concerns of co-optation and legitimation, which would, I think, force an, any organization to be uh, open to uh, being challenged constantly and having to reflect constantly as to whether, indeed, it is being co-opted or used uh, to, to legitimize other um, uh, abuse of power or a, a silencing function. And finally, I think, uh, uh, should you engage in anger creation or solution orientation? Certainly, I think the CCLEs has always taken the position that uh, uh, providing solution to decision makers, trying to advise them to act behind the scene to say, you should amend your legislation. We tried to appear in front of parliament to say, these are the amendments that you should uh, that you should put forward is part of the mandate. But at times, uh, anger creation can be very useful <laughs> and can be very effective. Who cares what the solution uh, would be if there's no political appetite to actually engage in it? So uh, the decision of uh, the strategic decision as to how do you up the ante of the discourse and the tone to move from uh, uh, the reasonable uh, dispassionate, uh, impartial, and uh, uh, nice to talk to um, uh, NGO to the one that actually uh, uh, supports uh, anger being uh, being legitimately expressed. I think is 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 also a, a, a place I think where we need a lot of, of reflection. So I want to uh, conclude by saying certainly to do all these uh, things, uh, if I may say, is um, the field of assessment of NGOs is highly politicized, and this is a good thing. Uh, people demand a certain virtue uh, from those who criticize others, and they should. So the advocacy function in a democracy is well served by a vibrant NGO sector who is self-critical, self-searching, attempting to evaluate and reflect on its flaws, on its quandaries. Uh, now, in the reality of NGO life, there's very little time to do so because you're constantly uh, searching, searching for money, uh, responding to crisis. That's why uh, we need a board of directors that have the capacity to bring wisdom. That's why we need academics who care, who pay attention to the dilemmas and help them. And that's why I think uh, we are here thanking John McCamus because it would not have prospered, it would not have survived but for his uh, patient attention and his uh, great wisdom in ensuring compliance with the mandate. And we are fortunate in a way, and I want to thank uh, Jamie Cameron, who's also a member of our board, uh, um, to have brought this issue forward at this, at this panel, because uh, to the extent that the academics will care and will try to help develop a, a more rigorous approach to assessment of NGO, we will all uh, will be uh, the better. So I'm particularly grateful for the opportunity that has been provided by Osgood today uh, to uh, reflect a little bit on these questions. Uh, so merci Osgood. Thank you, John. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm very pleased to uh, be able to participate in this uh, symposium today. Um, just on a personal note, uh, John McCamus did teach me contracts in first year and was also uh, a mentor on the Law Journal. Um, and, uh, and so it's nice to have a connection with this. I think that 
what the uh, the event today has shown us is the the challenge that uh, that John has posed about um, challenging us to look at law in its complicated, multi-dimensional way, and to draw links um, between the different dimensions in which uh, which law operates. Um, and so it's in that spirit that, that I'll make my comments today. Um, I've been asked to speak not so much with my academic hat on, but uh, with my ha under my hat as uh, someone who's been practicing in the area of uh, um, charter litigation for the last uh, for the last 20 years. Um, the focus of my uh, private practice has been. Um, constitutional litigation, representing a wide range of civil society organizations um, and advocating for a wide range of social and economic rights. Um, and I'd like to, from that framework, pick up on some of the themes from uh, both the, the panel over lunch and, and uh, some of the comments that uh, Natalie made. And I'd like to address five things. Um, First, the idea that Canadians care profoundly about the Charter um, and about fundamental human rights. Um, the second is that active participation of engaged citizens in democratic constitutionalism is the lifeblood of substantive democracy. Um, the third point is that litigating Charter rights is different. It's a unique kind of practice. And civil society organizations have created very unique and rich processes for negotiating constitutional meaning and accountability. And I want to spend some time in that area of under the bed law. I love that, uh, that notion. Um, but the uniqueness of the, this kind of work leads to my fourth point, which is that it requires a different kind of lawyering. Um, and from there, I'll take you to my last point, which is to touch on access to justice and, and give us a bit of a segue into the, uh, uh, the final panel. So my first point about uh, how Canadians care profoundly about the Charter, um, it's interesting, in the very short uh, time that we've had the Charter, how um, uh, compelling a symbol it has become of what it means to be Canadian. Um, and uh, last year, it was an opportunity to reflect on this, as it was the 30th anniversary of the Charter. And even though that landmark passed almost unremarked by government, um, there were a number of public surveys that, uh, that asked Canadians what they think about the Charter. And what are, the, what are some of the symbols that identify and define Canada for them? And what was fascinating is that in just a short 30-year period, the Charter has come to be one of the defining symbols of what it means to be Canadian. Um, in a number of polls last year, it uh, ranked second only to universal health care, which is consistently the number one uh, defining uh, Canadian icon. But uh, the Charter is consistently between sec the second and fourth on there. And when you drill down a little deeper into the substantive values that are articulated in the Charter, there's an even higher resonance, particularly around the value of equality. Um, and those public opinion surveys show that uh, in response to them, uh, regular Canadians are saying that they see the Charter as something that actually represents Canadian values that unite us as a nation deep Canadian values that show a commitment to human rights. Um, and they hold that dear. It's uh, interesting to contrast that with litigation that's just uh, come to light in the last couple of months that was just initiated in December by Edgar Schmidt um, out of the Department of Justice in Ottawa. Under the Canadian Bill of Rights, under the Department of Justice Act, and under the Statutory Instruments Act, the Minister of Justice has a legal obligation to review um, draft regulation and draft bills to ensure compliance with, uh, with the Charter, with the Bill of Rights, and with the enabling statutes under which um, regulations are made. And what Mr. Schmidt has revealed in his litigation is that since 1993, 
a policy has been implemented that, um, that establishes a remarkably low threshold for that screen, for what constitutes constitutional compliance. And let me just read a bit out of his statement of claim. Um, what he has said is that since 1993, with the knowledge and approval of the deputy minister, an interpretation of the statutory examination provisions has been adopted um, to the effect that what they require is the formation of opinion as to whether any provision of the legislative text being examined is manifestly or certainly inconsistent with the Bill of Rights or Charter. Um, and that there will not be a report to Parliament unless um, there's manifest non-compliance, certain inconsistency with the Charter. What does that mean? It means that if a provision is likely or even almost certainly inconsistent with the Bill of Rights or the Charter, even if the probability of inconsistency is 95% or more, but some argument can reasonably be made in favor of its consistency, even if all arguments in favor of consistency have a combined likelihood of success of 5% or less, there will be no report. Um, so that's a fairly um, weak screen for um, compliance with the fundamental laws of Canada. And it's into that gap that civil society has stepped. Um, and it's in that gap that civil society has an enormously important role to play as the defender of the Charter. Um, and so it's important when, when Natalie points out all the different ways in which attempts have been made to discredit civil society organizations, that there is a phenomenally important role um, that they serve in ensuring that the standards of our constitutional democracy are protected. Um, there are a, a wide range of civil society organizations that have been engaged in charter litigation over the last 30 years. And um, there's a rich history of both litigation that they've initiated and interventions that have been made to secure charter compliance, to protect the rule of law, to hold government and public institutions to account. And a lot has been written about uh, the substantive contribution that various uh, civil society organizations have made in uh, developing our uh, principles of interpretation of the Charter, particularly around um, equality rights. Um, as lawyers, we tend to give primacy to the formal institutions of law, courts, parliaments, legislatures, and uh, um, the so-called dialogue between them. Um, but I would like to uh, dive into that messy space under the bed that uh, Harry Arthurs was talking about, um, because I actually think that that's where the real action is. I think that's where the most interesting uh, things are happening around um, constitutional legitimacy. Um, and in this respect, I'm, I'm inspired by uh, Robert Post and Reva Siegel's writing about democratic constitutionalism. Um, and so if I can just uh, refer to some of their language, the way that they've described it is that the premise of democratic constitutionalism is that the authority of the Constitution depends on its democratic legitimacy. Um, it depends upon the Constitution's ability to inspire um, the population, they're, they uh, are Americans, so they're referring to Americans, but to inspire the population to recognize it as their constitution. Um, this belief, this idea of democratic constitutionalism is sustained by traditions of popular engagement that authorize citizens to make claims about the constitution's meaning and to oppose their government when they believe that it is not respecting the constitution. In this framework, um, disagreement, even um, very intense disagreement with the courts about the meaning of the Charter is not a failing of the democratic process, but is actually a healthy and expected part of it. It's a healthy and necessary part of the negotiation of constitutional norms. Um, and what you see is that even when there is a profound disagreement between 
um, how civil society understands charter rights and how they've been interpreted by the courts, this doesn't lead to a rejection of the charter and the values it expresses. Instead, civil society organizations hold very deeply to those values. Um, and what you see is, um, you know, as, as Post and Siegel say, when citizens speak about their most passionately held commitments in the language of a shared constitutional tradition, they invigorate that tradition. Even resistance to judicial interpretation can enhance the, constitutional, the Constitution's democratic legitimacy. Um, and it does that. It enhances the constitutional legitimacy because it, it retains a commitment to that framework for understanding what is the nature of the social contract that we have um, in society. It re retains a commitment to that way of framing values um, and for uh, engaging in a common discussion in common language. Um, the, uh, it's been very interesting for me working in this area. I was uh, in my first year of law school when the first, when Andrews, the first Section 15 case was released from the court. I was uh, in my very first term. And so I've had the, the enormous uh, privilege of being able to watch this, uh, this world open up and evolve over the last, uh, the last couple of decades. And the youth of the Charter is one of the things that makes this democratic constitutionalism so vibrant and so exciting. Um, the, the terms of the Charter were, of course, a product of a political process in which social, uh, social activists, uh, civil society organizations were deeply engaged. And they have um, an enduring sense of ownership of what that social contract was meant to be. Um, on the, 10th, uh, the 20th anniversary of the Charter, Bruce Porter wrote uh, about that, reflecting back on uh, what the expectations were in 1985 and, and have those expectations been fulfilled. And um, they certainly have not, particularly in the area of social and economic rights. But the fact that there is that gap between um, the expectations of what the Charter would deliver and what it has delivered to date has not led to a rejection of the Charter, but it's been a very self-conscious recognition that we're in the early days still and that there's a lot of work to do, but there is still a strong sense of ownership of the values in the Charter and the idea that um, that new social contract was actually meant to change the way things operate was meant to deliver a different kind of democracy, both in substance and in, in process. Um, and it's that gap. It's in that space between um, the, uh, the notion of what those values are that animate the charter and the way they're formally interpreted by the institutions of the court that uh, that there's, there's quite exciting action. And the role of civil society is important because uh, the charter and those formal rights only retain legitimacy to the extent that they speak to shared understanding of the people who are living under those instruments. And to the extent that the gap between um, the sense of ownership of those values and the way there's, they're interpreted by formal institutions grows too big, uh, you have a, a legitimacy gap. And what I'd speak to there is just the, the notion that the rule of law and the legitimacy um, of charter values are different things. To the extent that the rule of law can be a small and formal um, uh, sphere of charter compliance, um, there is still this much richer space to debate what is the meaning of, of constitute, what is constitutional meaning in a substantive sense. Um, and uh, in, so where, you know, uh, Natalie talked about the accountability of uh, civil society organizations in one respect. What I'd like to turn to is uh, accountability in, in process and some of the uniqueness in the way that um, civil society approaches uh, litigation. Um, because 
as much as there is uh, this very rich debate between civil society and formal legal institutions, there is an equally rich democratic discussion and negotiation of constitutional meaning within civil society organizations themselves. Um, most civil society organizations do not exist for the sake of law and litigation. Um, they engage with that mandate only reluctantly and when all other um, paths have failed. Um, it is not their, their raison d'etre. Um, but that doesn't mean that they have a disengagement with law. They have, as I said, um, the, a strong commitment to the values that animate the charter. And they, in their daily working with different populations, live those values and try to create the public space where those values are realized in practice. Um, and when it runs up against uh, the formal law, there is friction. Um, but in terms of, of process, one of the things that I've found uh, quite fascinating over the last 20 years is the ways in which um, organizations seek to ensure that they, have, that they have a legitimate voice, that they have fully consulted with uh, the people who will be affected by their actions when they go into court. And, um, the, uh, and that's an area that's, that I don't think is given enough uh, credence, but I think it is something that has, very, um, has developed in a very unique way in this, this sphere of law. Um, in the, the best sort of circumstances where I'm, I'm working with civil society organizations, um, I will be instructed by large advisory committees that may have 20, 25 um, different representatives of them, on them, um, representing a wide range of different uh, people and organizations on the ground, frontline organizations, who will be affected by any piece of litigation. And there is always a very active discussion and negotiation between um, members on advisory committees about what does this constitutional value mean to you? What does, how do we arrive at a shared understanding of how to engage with a particular issue, what its implications are, um, and, and what, uh, what remedies we should be seeking? And it's in those discussions that you see that there's a much richer um, notion of substantive democracy than what you get when you just look at the formal um, products of the legal process. It's that discussion, um, that, that engaged participatory sense of ownership of, of charter values that makes the, the charter a living document um, and that infuses uh, the, the lived, or that in, infuses those values into the way lives are lived and relationships are built. One of the other things that I found very interesting over the last 20 years is an evolution in how civil society groups have engaged in litigation. Um, 20 years ago, uh, I would often see individual organizations going forward one by one, each separately seeking intervention um, in litigation. Um, they may coordinate during the course of the litigation to talk about what their different positions would be, but they would have come there independently with their own mandates. What's happening much more now is the building of broad-based coalitions that together intervene in cases, and together in the, the formation of those coalitions engage in that same kind of negotiation around constitutional meaning um, that, that happens in the advisory committees within individual organizations. And again, I think that rich constitutional conversation and engagement uh, builds uh, the engaged citizenship that we need to have uh, to ensure protection of, of substantive democracy. Um, it also builds, uh, you know, there's a number of practical things that feed into it, like lack of funding. There's f there are fewer and fewer national organizations that can speak with an individual voice and organizations on the ground uh, have limited resources so can't have the luxury of each um, intervening. But I think that it goes beyond that. I think it's not, the, the coalition building is not just a reflection of, of stripped resources, um, but of an understanding of the interconnectedness of fundamental rights. That, um, you know, that you can't have uh, real civil and political rights if you don't have fundamental social and economic rights. If you don't have housing, you can't get a job or vote. And understanding the interconnectedness of, 
fundamental rights, understanding the ways in which different civil society organizations have come at common cause and shared vision, um, has built for a much richer constitutional tradition um, in, in Canada than, uh, um, than appears apparent just from the, uh, the bald law. And so working in this area, um, I think, um, imposes different obligations and responsibilities of a lawyer and how to engage with this. And Natalie has, has touched upon this in terms of um, ensuring that you're not appropriating voice. Um, and what I would say is it starts with a recognition of the power that comes with the label of lawyer and um, knowing that you need to work with that quite consciously to share power and to open space for, um, for people to advocate for themselves in their own voices. Um, in those moments of working with civil society organizations, um, it's important to be, to be humble, to know that you are not actually the expert, that it's, you just brought a certain set of tools to the table but it's the other 25 people around the table who have the real expertise on the issues and the, um, the lived implications of the things that, that you will be arguing. So there's, it, I feel a real responsibility to be a translator, to be someone who engages deeply in cross-cultural lawyering um, in the broadest sense. Uh, and to recognize that those moments of, of lawyering in these areas are equally moments of community organizing and community education, that the role of the lawyer is to help build legal literacy, to help um, distribute, to democratize law, to give people the tools to be able to advocate for themselves and um, to be able to create the space so you can step back and let people advocate um, for themselves. Um, and to speak plainly when we go into court to ensure that the way that we frame uh, claims and the way that we make argument is actually understandable to, uh, to the communities that, uh, that we are serving. Um, but most importantly, recognizing that litigation is only ever a tiny, tiny piece of the puzzle and that litigation that's disconnected from um, the social movements and the political movements um, lacks its own legitimacy and, and runs the risk of, uh, of as, as Natalie said, having someone stand in the place uh, of those who will be directly affected and claim to speak on their behalf, but not in fact do so. Um, the last point that I would raise is um, the issue of access to justice and the reality that um, working with civil society organizations and doing this kind of work um, you, you run up against constantly the reality that most of this work is done pro bono. Um, and, the, and done pro bono against an opposing side with seemingly unlimited resources. Um, and it's something that I, I put out there. I don't have a solution to it because I know there's another panel that is actually going to be addressing access to justice. But I think that it's an important point to raise as a practical matter of um, advocating for fundamental uh, constitutional rights, fundamental human rights. If it has been being done um, uh, pro bono, that's not a sustainable a sustainable model. It draws on a sense of public service and public commitment to um, to our, our defining uh, social compact, but it's uh, it is not a model that uh, uh, that ensures that 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 there is a sustainable uh, resource for ensuring that protection going forward. Sonia? Okay, um, I think I'm just gonna sit here. Yeah, it's on. Um, it's really a pleasure to get to speak at this symposium in honor of John and on this panel with these uh, two women who I've learned so much for, from over the years. Um, when I started at Osgood, my colleagues thought it would be a good idea if I taught the same section as John. And um, at the one time, I thought there might be a way to turn this to my advantage and instead of it being an awkward comparison on an uh, ever other, every other day basis, uh, was when my students, the only question they thought that I could answer for them was, what should we call you? 
And so I triumphantly said that, they, well, what do you call your contracts, professor? And um, they said, God? <laughs> so anyway, I didn't work out so well. I didn't try that again. Um, I, I think uh, one of the things I'd like to, what the thing I'd like to talk about now is um, just briefly focus on the legitimacy portion of these presentations and then try to link that to a kind of challenge um, for both lawyers and more generally advocacy organizations uh, that arises, I think, out of the, the reality of social differences and, and um, inequality in our civil society groups. So I kind of want to generally push on the nature of this relationship with, with grassroots that both of these presentations um, looked at, and that is, the kind of uh, relationship between specific concerns and systemic concerns and the way in which those things have to be linked. And what I'm thinking about is the way in which, the, to the extent that the grassroots or the membership or mm -hmm. there are a variety of different ways of thinking about this does not bring the systemic concerns, I think the expertise and role of the lawyer or the organization should and can be, I think, used in an educative way. This isn't um, in any way, I think, a critique of the presentations that we just heard. It's more a, a complication mm -hmm. in terms of thinking about the appropriate role of these organizations. Um, you know, I think in part this has to do with the nature of lawyers' work and also advocacy organizations and that what they work on is often cases or controversies or campaigns. That is, the work itself often of necessity requires narrowing the frame or keeping the frame narrow in order to sharpen the focus or for litigation purposes to make litigation possible. So my suggestion I just thought we could think about, and I'm sure you guys have many questions and I look forward to that time, so I'm not going to speak for too long, but my suggestion is just that in terms of Natalie's short or long-term uh, focus or phase questions about the lawyer's role, we need to think about how to make that space for the NGO or the lawyer um, to speak back to the membership or the grassroots. Um, in a similar way that, that you know, we're thinking about the way government lawyers have to freely speak to their client about a range of possible mm -hmm. uh, legal interpretations or, or legal meanings of our charter. So the NGO or the lawyer has to bring the systemic concerns which bring other related experiences back into the frame. So I'm just going to briefly try to give an example of what I'm talking about and how this creates uh, challenges for NGOs and lawyers, and then um, we'll move right to the questions. The best example I have in the ch of this kind of challenge is a very local one, and it's one about the uh, dramatic demand for police and government accountability after the G20. Um, a controversy in which the CCLA, I think, played a really critical role. And I found myself um, shocked and a bit disheartened to see the extent of mobilization and engagement, which is a bizarre thing to say. But the reason I felt that way is because of all the ways in which that mobilization and engagement was not linked to very long-term, long-expressed, and long ignored concerns expressed by Toronto's black community about mm -hmm. similar kinds of police abuses. Um, where communities were treated to and are still treated to uh, very speci special police squads, very specific kinds of strategies that are not usually employed elsewhere in the city or on other people in this city. And I think there are ways in which the lack of that link really reinscribed the sense that police accountability was not an absolute requirement, but a kind of a sliding scale, you know, depending on who is being mistreated. So, I definitely don't think that this connection failed to appear in a broader public discourse or in the media because the CCLA didn't try. I think they really did try and they tried really hard, but in the end it might be that making that kind of connection appear is a harder task than holding the police to account for abusing the sons and daughters of the middle class. Um, and I think there's, I think maybe we could think about how recognizing that kind of problem, that kind of kind of connection and the difficulty of making that connection is part of achieving true impact or effectiveness, but also incredibly difficult to achieve. And just one last little connection is the way, when, when Faye talks about or when we think about how deeply Canadians care about their charter, I think um, 
one of the things we need to focus on is those deep divisions in civil society so that to the extent that Canadians care about the protection the Charter can offer them, but don't recognize or support the ways in which the Charter might offer similar or different protections to people in, living in quite a different Canada, um, their caring is an, is an interesting sign uh, of a strong charter culture, but it's not necessarily the strong charter culture that we might need to affect um, a more systemic form of change. So those are just brief comments on two presentations that I, I really enjoyed and they should not be in any way taken as critique. Thanks. Thanks, Sonia. So we've uh, quite deliberately uh, programmed some time in for questions and comments. Uh, there's microphones uh, on both sides of the room. If you do have any questions or comments you'd like to make, please approach the microphone. And if you could just identify yourself, because this is being recorded, and it will assist for posterity purposes to know who you were. Any takers? Sean? Sean Rehe? Uh Hi, so th thanks for those uh, presentations. They're both uh, really interesting. Um, I've got a question for, for Nathalie. Um, so I think one of the things that a legitimate, accountable NGO has to do is it has to learn from its mistakes. And it has to learn from its, its failures, I think. And so one thing that I've been wondering about uh, in terms of the fallout from the debates over C31, over mm -hmm. designated foreign nationals, is what should what the should advocacy community learn from that? And I'm thinking, I'm thinking quite specifically about uh, the claims about uh, the, the charter breach, the Section 7 charter mm -hmm. breach for mandatory one-year unreviewable detention for people who just happen to come to the country uh, irregularly, uh, which could include uh, children. Uh, for example, the original Bill C-31. And every single uh, lawyer on the public record who has looked at this mm -hmm. part of the legislation, including Stephen Harper's current special advisor on immigration uh, issues, has said that it is clearly unconstitutional. There, there, was, there was no, no <laughs> one has suggested that one year unreviewable detention is constitutional. So then, if we've got a Canadian public that, as Faye tells us, is interested in charter rights. And we have probably the clearest example in the last, you know, in, in recent years of legislation that clearly unconstitutional. And if the advocacy community was unable not just to change the legislation, I mean, there's the, the, the change in terms of six months instead of one year. But not, not only was the advocacy community unable to stop the legislation, but it didn't even win the public relations fight. I mean, the, the, the public is, is generally of the view that, you know, this legislation's a good idea, Jason Kenney's doing a good, uh, doing a good uh, job, notwithstanding all of these advocacy uh, efforts. So for me, the, the failure of the advocacy community, and I, I was very much in, involved in, in, in this, so it's my failure as well, but um, the failure of the advocacy community is not in persuading, you know, the Tories that they shouldn't have passed this legislation. Uh, the failure was in, in persuading the, the, the public. And so I, I just wonder, why do you think in this clearest of cases, why did we fail? Well, if you're in this business for a long time, you uh, rephrase failure by saying, uh, let's see next time. You know, I, I, I think you, I mean, you know, it's, this, this is an August uh, result. Uh, we're in February, there's litigation uh, starting and uh, um, so at times, I think if I have to look at the different strategies that we've tried to uh, engage in, and I, I was, uh, I think, bolstered a little bit my, um, my opinion by Collingwood, who says, well, you know, at times, you know, they won't listen to you because they're winning and they don't need you. Well, so you move to a more aggressive uh, litigation, uh, so on. You can also ask for review to say, you know, we got to review, the, you know, and this, uh, we have to review this aspect in uh, two years, in three years, in five years. So you can ask for process uh, changes as opposed to changing the litigation. So uh, I agree that uh, it was very disheartening uh, that a, not only, even the CCLA, we did this little sort of 
put people in jail, the average person in jail, to say we're going to do, for once, we're going to do YouTube stuff. And uh, uh, we got very little uptake. Our own members would call me and say, hey, you're the Canadian Civil Liberties Association. Why are you doing taking that issue on? You know, so to the depth of, of antagonism uh, to, to uh, using, uh, saying, the way in which immigration policy is developed is a, a, a civil liberties issue for, for everyone, uh, created a, a, some challenges even in, in that score. So it shows we better work harder. <laughs> you know, like there's a real depth, the, 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 I think the, the ways in which we will have to be, uh, and so, you know, the short answer is now we're putting immigration issues on our education materials more often. Uh, we are challenging certainly the, the very issue that, uh, as, you know, distinctions on citizenships are legitimate. Uh, so we're, you know, kind of engaging on, on that front. Certainly sometimes you have to take the fight maybe at the international level or, um, so I, my sense is the, the failure is um, maybe just show the, the way in which it's, that's where we are, that's where Canadian society is now. They've been fed for a long time the idea that it's Canadian citizens that, that own the charter. This, it was not the law, but they had that issue, and now it has to, we have to move beyond that. So uh, let's keep talking and think about the larger strategies. Certainly, I think we... Could we say we focus too narrowly on using, I, I agree with you, I really did not like the fact that we used the, I think the children was too narrow a point, too easy to respond to. It was too easy to amend the statute, you know, to, to avoid the children being in jail. So there are ways in which this, the advocacy could have been maybe a little bit higher to get a, a better result. I don't know. My sense is we were going to lose anyway, but uh, uh, good point. So, and I actually like very much the idea just on the G20. I, I agree. I think the the way in which we could um, think of another dilemma. You know, in my paper, I'm now thinking that there's additional dilemmas that that need to be uh, how you can be captured by not f reframing the debate in a in a in a sufficiently clear and transparent way to show where you're going. Mm -hmm. The only piece that I Apparently, the microphone does not want to be touched. Um, the only piece that I would add to that is uh, um, looking creatively for where your allies may be that allies may be in places that um, are in the so-called indifferent, but being able to hook them in to understand their, um, how this issue relates to them um, is, is something that I think a lot of organizations uh, need to be more, more creative about so that the conversations um, get bigger. Um. So uh, just a... Um Question building on uh, Faye's um, reference to pro bono and some of what's come out of um, the uh, remarks, uh, Natalie, of yours around the CCLA, which I think has been uh, actually a, a really innovative leader in harnessing the contributions, uh, both of what little funding there is and of the, uh, you know, kind of passions and commitments of, of many people who are willing to do incredible things without uh, getting paid for them. I'm thinking, you know, the G20, the other story that uh, isn't told as often as it should is the amazing role for law students and others as observers. And and I guess, you know, I'm very sensitive to Faye's point, like that's not good enough for the fragility of our fundamental rights to rest on, the time and effort that those who can afford to devote time and effort might do. But at the same time, I think there are these fringe men, in other words, like just looking at the experiences that resonate, talking to these civil litigators, uh, who are mostly representing banks and utility companies who've taken on, you know, the CCLA case, and it has been transformative, not just to them, but to everyone they talk to, everyone they hang out with. And similarly, those students, many of whom are going to go on to be IP uh, lawyers and trade lawyers and any other kind of lawyers, 
had been affected by that experience in ways that are very difficult to say is part of the problem. Uh, even though I'm sympathetic to the view that it can't be the solution. Uh, but I, I, I guess I resist that sense of saying until we have you know, full funding for the full representational rights of all the cases that deserve to be brought forward on civil liberties grounds, uh, you know, then we have something um, uh, to lament. I, I wonder if there's space to both keep that lament, right? The funding does need to happen, but there are a lot of people who take that um, perfect enemy the best mentality. Better that we try to squelch pro bono because it'll look like that Band-Aid that we don't really need to fix the underlying disease as long as we can muddle by with this. So I struggle with that because I want to celebrate and support pro bono. I actually think it's the best thing I've ever seen. It's the most inspiring thing I've ever come across in this community. How can that be bad? And yet it's a compelling argument that as long as we don't have that culture of entitlement to legal representation, uh, there is something meaningfully missing in um, what we say we believe so strongly in around the right. So I just wanted to know that you're bonding with me, at least in struggling, uh, in the same way, because you, know, you two think about this, and Sonia, of course, as well, in ways that are you know, very um, genuine and I learn from all the time, so. Um, I, would, I would just want to add, I guess, two, two comments to that, and and I think that it's I think it's great to be able to have, like for people to get engaged and to use those opportunities, and certainly the uh, uh, student observer work during the G20 was phenomenal, and, and seeing the energy that uh, that brought and how it inspired young lawyers, I thought was fantastic. Um, the two things that that I would say is first of all in um, that this is actually a very sophisticated. Uh, area of law um, where you're dealing with uh, clients with very complicated multi-dimensional problems. And to treat it as an area of law where people can just parachute in um, is, it, it does a disservice to the nature of the work and um, the expertise that's developed over many years and, and the complexity and importance of the issues. That's one thing. And I think that finding ways to be able to support that expertise is tremendously important given the nature of the rights. The second thing that I would say is that, um, and it touches on what, what Sonia raised, is that um, most of these issues that we're dealing with have uh, deep systemic causes. And it's uh, when you're doing work pro bono on a shoestring, being able to uh, do the deep research and the alliance building and the evidence gathering that you need to be able to um, to unpack the, the systemic problems is impossible. Um, and so you end up treating every episode as if it's aberrant, right? Um, and if you could just fix that one aberrant notion, then everything's okay, as opposed to recognizing that um, you need to change the systems. I, I, can I just add sure. this answer one briefly? Last Actually, this, this will be another dilemma uh, to, uh, to add to the paper. But let me just say how, in my own mind, I try to live with myself. Um, I actually do think that um, we are trying to create uh, a smarter pro bono. Like, I, and I agree, I could not agree with you more that the dabbling and the one-off is um, a thing of the past, and I think instead we have to really create almost some expertise within pro bono. So we try to graduate people. <laughs> you know, they represent to CLA in one case, and then they represent. Then you know, you are privacy people, and you need to get good at it. And if you're not good at it, it's not good enough. And you know, so I think the demand uh, for uh, creating some rigor uh, is 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 important and some expertise. My hope is that eventually short of celebrating each other for how much they're doing it, it's going to be how well it's being done as opposed to how much. So I think that's one, one, one piece uh, that needs to be done. And I think what it does also is create uh, the ability to have a, a, a civil liberties bar that is larger. So you know there is this aspect of uh, enlarging the tent uh, to create uh, uh, allies at time that, that may come. And my third point would be simply that uh, we should continue to work to creating a better demand for, um, so we intervene in cases on access to justice all the time as a, as a matter of principle. 
uh, that if we're going to, to tolerate pro bono, rely on it, uh, love it, and nurture it, we uh, owe it to the system to just be more demanding on, on uh, so that would be my uh, strategy. Okay, that's our time. I want to uh, thank our panelists and our discussant uh, for their presentations. And I want to inform you that we're now gonna have a break uh, from now until 3 p.m. Uh, so get some refreshments, and then we'll be reconvening at 3 for the final panel of the day, Access to Justice. And again, thank you, you three. Thank you.